In this video, I'm going to talk about a Camp DeCormick posture that is not common, but is seen in both Parkinson's and similar movement disorders. First, I'm going to discuss what Camp DeCormia is, and then I'm going to talk about how posture can affect your back pain. We're then going to take a glimpse at the walking characteristics of people with Camp DeCormia how they accommodate for their posture. There's many types of exercises that you can do for this condition, but you should really see a physical therapist to individualize your approach because there's a wide range of capabilities. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at the different types of support that you can use for walking. Typically, walking stamina is limited because of back pain, and we want to improve your ability to walk longer distances so you maintain your stamina and functional walking. Typically, when patients are coming to me for therapy, they're coming to me because they have Parkinson's or similar movement disorders, and not necessarily specifically because they have a Camp DeCormick type of posture. But when these individuals come in, these are their common complaints. They have a progressive worsening of their bending down posture as they're walking. Some will report involuntary tensing of their abdominal muscles, which can be dystonia. As their back pain worsens with walking, their walking becomes more limited, so they can't walk as far. And then when they're sitting or lying down, their back pain reduces dramatically. So that's a constellation of typical symptoms that I hear patients complain about. The description of a Camp DeCormick posture is a forward flexed posture of 45 degrees or more. It worsens with standing, but primarily with walking. And then it disappears when you're sitting or lying down. It's been my observation that these individuals aren't losing their balance forward because of their posture. And part of it, I think, is because they keep their hips and knees flexed, and that seems to counterbalance them. You can see with this individual, when she initially, she's standing up, her posture looks pretty good but it's when she starts walking that she gets that forward bend posture. She uses her hands on her thighs for support to relieve her back discomfort and allow her to walk longer distances. When she's lying down, she's able to fully straighten out, and when she's sitting, her posture looks fine other than some mild age-related postural changes. So what causes camp decormia? Well, there's two things that contribute to it. The first thing is a myopathy of the paravertebrals in your low back. So what does that mean? That means there's a weakening of the deep muscles in your low back, but it's very focal. It's confined to that area, so it's not gonna spread. And then what can also contribute to it is dystonia of your abdominal muscles. So your abdominal muscles tend to tense up involuntarily and it can be triggered with standing up or walking or some people, if they reach over their head, their abdominal muscles tend to tense up. So those are the two main things that contribute to it. So why does your back hurt? Well, in order to understand that, we first need to take a look at a healthy spine. So on the left here, we have what we call lumbar lordosis. The deep muscles in your back help maintain that lordotic curve. When your muscles become weak, they can't hold that lordotic curve. What happens is you get a kyphotic posture. So it's a reversal of the lordotic curve. Here we have a close-up of the low back showing on the left side the normal lordotic curve and then on the right side the kyphotic posture when the muscles have gotten weak. Now if you take a closer look there's ligaments that are in between these bones back here. The purpose of the ligaments is to protect your joints from extreme positions similar to the forward bent posture when you're walking. So for example if you think of this rubber band as your ligament and then my fingers as the two bones in your spine, and you're bending down, and you can see how that ligament can be stretched. So when you're bending down for a long period of time and walking longer distances, it starts creating this deep achiness in your back. But then when you go to sit down or lay down, you relieve that overstretch on that ligament, and then you get pain relief. Next, we're going to look at the walking characteristics of people who have Camptochormia. 
It's been my experience that people with camptochromia, the further they walk, the further down they bend. And everybody has a different range as individual. Also, they tend to walk with longer strides. I don't typically see freezing in these individuals, which I just find interesting. So we're gonna take a look at a video here of someone who has camptochromia and some of the things that she does to help compensate. So she is working, walking with a little bit smaller steps, but she pushes her hand there to help straighten herself up. If you notice, her, her hips and her knees are a little bit flexed, and I think that helps counterbalance. Then she puts her hands behind her back, and I think that helps control some of her back pain and counterbalance her forward posture. Typically, the goals that we set in therapy are very functional. To be able to walk for longer distances so that you can do your daily activities and be able to walk distances when you're out with your family or friends going to a park so you can walk the distances that everybody else can at the pace that everybody else can. And then also to protect your spine and to reduce your back pain. There's two ways of accomplishing these goals and that's with exercise and with some sort of external support. When you start strengthening exercises you want to make sure that you do it correctly and safely and to your level of abilities and that's where a physical therapist can really help with guiding you in terms of what you need to do to maximize your strength without causing harm. So here I just have a list of muscle groups that really need to be targeted in terms of strengthening. The back extensors, the latissimus, the gluteal muscles, and the hamstrings all target bringing you more upright as best as can be. And then I also added the quadriceps and the calf muscles for general conditioning. We want to keep those thigh and calf muscles strong for transfers and for walking. Oops, I did make a mistake. I need to add hip abductors to this list. They're the muscles on the sides of your hips and they're very important for balance and they do tend to get deconditioned easily. So add uh, hip abductors to that list. The latissimus dorsi is a superficial muscle in the back and it attaches to your pelvis and it's not affected by the myopathy. This is one muscle we can strengthen to help support our back. As you saw in that video with that person walking, she pushed against the wall briefly to help straighten up her back. I believe she was using the latissimus to help do that. I'm just going to go over a couple of strengthening exercises that I've commonly used for people with camptochromia. Again, you should talk to your therapist to make sure that you're doing things that don't cause harm and are at your level of abilities. This is a bridging exercise and there's a complete progression with bridging. The first one on top here, the arms are at the side so you can use your arms to assist with bridging to help lift up your buttocks. And that's okay to do that because you're also working that latissimus muscle as well. And then the next progression is doing your arms crossed and trying to lift up and then it goes on and on in terms of level of difficulty and you and the therapist can help determine what's best. These strengthening exercises on your hands and knees target a lot of the muscles that you need to target. There's a whole progression of these kind of exercises. When you're on your hands and knees, sometimes it can be a little bit strenuous on your wrist and hand and to reduce the strain in that area you can put a towel roll on the floor and then just kind of grab the towel roll so that it's a lot more comfortable for you. This is just another exercise to help strengthen what you need to strengthen. It also helps the stretch the quad muscles. Now people that have knee arthritis have difficulty doing that and then that's why you have a physical therapist to find alternatives for exercises that you can do. But here's a video. So you just roll the ball up and then roll it forward. Start out with the ball against a wall so that it doesn't slip away from you. 
and then you can progress it by staying up there, letting go of the ball. There's diff many different versions. This is just a progression from the exercise with the Swiss ball. So you're on your hands and knees and you go into a kneeling position. While you're up there, you can also do arm exercises for an example. So now I'm gonna give you some examples of stretching exercises. Uh, this one, everybody loves this exercise. They're, they're reaching with their heels and they're reaching with their hands, or you can do just reach with your left side, reach with your left arm and your left leg and do that for a while and then do your right side. And then you'll notice a difference that one side is tighter than the other, that's very typical. Earlier we talked about the lumbar lordosis is your natural curve of your low back. And with camptochormia, you have a kyphosis. So what we wanna do is promote the lordosis range of motion in your back. And one way of doing that is sitting in the back of a firm chair and bringing your arms up over your head. That also works on your shoulder flexibility, which can become limited. Now, some individuals can also add a roll behind their back to further accentuate that, and for other people, they can't tolerate that. Another way of promoting the lumbar lordosis, as you can see here, you have the curved back, you've got the kyphosis of the lumbar spine as well, and here this is an exercise where you can keep your elbows straight, hands on the countertop, and heels flat and then you lean forward like you're bringing your stomach forward and that's to help promote that lumbar lordosis as you can see here. Here we have the last example of stretching exercises and this is stretching the hamstrings. And the hamstrings tend to get tight because there's a tendency to walk with a little bit more of flexed knees uh, but also the hamstrings are working over time trying to help bring your posture up. Uh, through your pelvis. So we really need to stretch those hamstrings and this is just a simple way of doing it. Again, there's many alternatives in a way that is doable for you and tolerable. I should add that doing this in a very stable chair, more stable than in this picture, is important so your chair doesn't tip. Over the years of seeing individuals with camptochormia, I have tried the following things. I've tried a lumbar corset, I've tried a cane, and I've tried a walker. With numerous individuals, I've tried all three. The barometer that I used regarding which device to use would be the one that offered sufficient pain control for their back so they can walk functional distances. So many people that I've worked with were limited to walking maybe 100 feet before they would have to sit down, and that would be pretty typical. And so we would try the corset, and that would help some. Their pain was a little bit better, but maybe now they could walk 150 feet, for example. Then we tried the cane, similar responses. And then we tried the rollator, and it was amazing in the difference in improvement of pain control while the individual was walking. Like for example, I had one individual that could walk maybe 150 feet and the immediate response when using the rollator, he could walk a quarter mile in our hallways and he could have gone further. So that's a huge difference and it has big implications in terms of your ability to get around. Sometimes using a rollator can be a difficult thing to accept but I think if you think about how it can control your pain and enable you to walk more functionally, I think those are some considerations to help you with that. When people get a rollator or walker, the tendency is to adjust the handles very high with the thought of it correcting your posture. It doesn't correct your posture, but it does put more strain on your arms and in your neck region. Here in figure A, you can see that the walker height is too high. The elbow is like at 90 degrees. Then picture B shows the proper height for the person's posture. And then in picture C, I superimposed those two pictures and you can see that the posture has not changed even though the arm position has. Here's an example of somebody walking with the handle height too high for his posture. 
and then the next video will show with the handle height more at the proper height. So it's typically lower than you would normally adjust a walker for, but because his posture has now changed, he's in essence a bit shorter, so the walker needs to be lower. Also, what's difficult to do sometimes is walking inside the walker. Because of the forward bent posture, your feet tend to be behind the back wheels of the walker. And learning to walk inside the walker is important because if the walker is too far ahead of you, it can get away from you. So it's important to walk inside the walker in order to have better control of the walker. So just take a look at this one video here with the handle height too high. So he was deliberately trying to step into the walker. On this next video, he has gotten used to that, and also the handle height is a little bit lower. He looks more comfortable with the walker handle height lower as well. This is the last video of watching somebody with Camptochormia walking with a rollator with a very low handle height to the point where the elbows are essentially straight. I think this handle height helps him use his latissimus muscle more effectively to help with a more upright posture. So here's the video. You can see he walks with a nice long stride and no freezing. His elbows are pretty straight and he's staying up pretty straight too. His turns look good and he's staying inside the walker. There are many causes to low back pain, but back pain due to poor posture is typically localized to your low back. When you get into a good posture, it helps relieve the pain. So that can help you differentiate a little bit some sources of pain. Also, exercise is so critical. You want to maintain your strength and flexibility to maintain your daily activities and get around and stay independent. And also exercise is important to compensate for the weakness in the deep muscles in your low back. It has been my experience with all the individuals that I've seen with Camptochormia. A walker has been very beneficial to help you walk functional distances with much less pain. How consistently you use the walker is very individual. For example, if you can walk fine in your home and you don't have much pain because you're going shorter distances, then you reserve the use of using the walker for longer distances for when you need it. So that's just one example. And again, it's very individual. And then bottom line, seeing physical therapy to individualize your needs and then have discussions like this as far as when you would use a walker and when you wouldn't or when it's beneficial. If you want to see more videos like this one, go to YouTube and enter Mia Bolin or to go to my website, parkinsonspt.com. Thank you.